Hello, I am Sarah Marino with Nature Photo Guides. Thank you for joining me for this video. Today, we will be talking through all of the steps for taking and processing this photograph, Twilight at Medicine Lake. This video features photo number six in our ongoing Field to Finished series. The first five photos in this series are discussed in our ebook, Five Photographs from Field to Finished. This ebook is available for free to our newsletter subscribers. If you would like to learn more about this free ebook or our other free resources for nature photographers, you can learn more at www.naturephotoguides.com slash sign up. I selected this photo for this video because it generally complements the content in our course Black and White Photography, A Complete Guide for Nature Photographers, and our photo processing course on Lightroom specifically. Although I usually process photos in both Lightroom and Photoshop, I am going to use mostly Lightroom for this video. You can learn more about the full course and the Lightroom course in particular on our website as well. For this video, we will cover the following topics. The story behind the photo, my field practices, including a discussion on composition and my camera settings, my process for visualizing the final result in black and white, and my start to finish processing steps primarily using Lightroom. I took this photograph in Jasper National Park in the Canadian Rockies. Years before this trip, I visited the Canadian Rockies for the first time and found the dramatic mountain scenery to be enchanting. Although I was at the very beginning of my journey with nature photography and knew very little about taking photographs, I picked up Darwin Widget's book, How to Photograph the Canadian Rockies, as part of preparing for the trip. That book includes a wonderful photograph of the ramparts, a section of sheer peaks in the backcountry of Jasper National Park. The valley at the base of these peaks is filled with alpine lakes, tarns, and many other kinds of interesting scenery, plus wildlife like bears, caribou, and the charming but murderous stoat. Although the trip took a few years to happen, that photo in Darwin Widget's book inspired possibly my favorite backpacking trip to date, which I made with two fellow photographers, my husband Ron Coscarosa and our friend Cave Tavakol. Because the backpacking trip would end up being about 40 miles over four days, we decided on an easy location for sunset the night before our hike. We selected Medicine Lake, which you see here. Medicine Lake is a fascinating geologic oddity due to its location over a series of underground caves. As the river flows into the lake, the water drains out the bottom, and the lake only fills when the river flow is high enough to outpace the flow through the drains in the bottom of the lake. One of my favorite things about the Canadian Rockies is the fascinating patterns in the mountains. The geology of this area is on display on a grand scale. The mountains around Medicine Lake in particular are a great example of this geology, with the uplift patterns and the geologic striations creating a lot of visual interest. On this evening, none of us were particularly excited about the conditions. The wind was blowing enough to leave ripples on the surface of the lake most of the time. And at the time, I was going through a cloud snob phase, so a clear sky didn't seem that exciting. While the twilight glow and soft colors were pretty, I didn't think much of the photos I took that evening, and at the time, did not think about converting any of the files to black and white. Since I took this photo, my photographic preferences have changed. I do not care as much about clouds as I once did, and I came to appreciate the graphic qualities of this scene. I have a years-long photo processing backlog, and I am trying to catch up. Through the process of going through all of my old files, I came across the files from this particular evening, and with a lot of time and distance, I finally saw some potential in this scene. In looking at the raw version of this photograph, here are a few attributes that made me decide it might look good as a black and white photograph. The natural tonal contrast between the lighter tones in the sky and water, the midtones in the peaks and rocks, and the darker tones in the trees. Next, the strong graphic qualities of the scene, like the dominant mountains, the tree silhouettes, and the reflection. Even though I was annoyed at the wind on the night I took this photo, I like the slight imperfections in the reflection. 
the ripples add some visual interest that a perfect reflection might not. And finally, I like the simplicity of this composition. One of the trends right now in landscape photography is creating complex and sometimes visually overwhelming compositions. In this case, I like the simple composition because it lends a feeling of solitude and calm, which I like. Now I will share some alternative compositions that I worked with while in the field. As you can see here, I have four major variations. First, this scene has two foreground rocks, the scene with just one foreground rock, the scene with just the straight reflection and no foreground rocks, and the scene photographed vertically. The scene with the single rock seems unbalanced. Including one rock seems more like trying to include something for a foreground rather than including an element that adds to the composition. With one rock, the visual cues are all confused in this scene. For example, the rock pointing to the right and the left, and the mountain pointing up and down. The arrows on the screen show some of this visual confusion, which I think lends a feeling of chaos rather than cohesion. Next, we will look at the vertical scene. Here, I used a wide-angle lens at 35 millimeters. I liked the vertical composition because of the interesting rocks along the shore of the lake, at the time at least. Looking back, I don't think this composition works as well. With this composition, the mountains look quite small. In person, the powerful part of this scene is the dramatic and imposing mountains. The power of the mountains get lost in the vertical composition. And without clouds, I think there is too much empty space in this scene. With clouds, both the sky and the reflection would be filled with bit more visual interest, but without the clouds, there just isn't enough here for me to feel like this is a cohesive, interesting scene. The only two versions of this photo that I would consider processing are the scene with the reflection and the scene with the two rocks. While I like the scene with the simple reflection and think it could work in color, I think the scene with the two rocks will work best in black and white. The rocks add visual interest as foreground elements, but they also add tonal contrast by adding spots of darkness in the lighter reflection. Together, the two rocks help ease the visual confusion that I talked about with the single rock. Now the two rocks mirror each other, adding yet another element of repetition to the scene. I do wish the rocks were just a little bit more similar, either in size or texture, especially since the rock on the right is a lot more interesting than the rock on the left. One of the main rules for composition for landscape photographers is that you are never supposed to center a subject, which I think is actually a pointless rule. The idea behind this rule is that centering a subject is boring, whereas placing a subject off-center adds interest and makes a scene more dynamic. Well, in certain circumstances, I do not want a scene to be more dynamic. Centering a subject helps add balance and reduce visual tension, which can be a positive for some scenes. In this case, I think the symmetry between the land and its reflection works best when centered. Also, the mountain is nearly centered in this composition as well. The mountain, with its interesting patterns, is meant to be the main focus of the photo, so centering it helps make that clear. As an aside, I find most photography composition rules to be pointless. Instead, I think it can be helpful to learn composition concepts and then always think deliberately about how to apply them in the field. Instead of never center your subject, a better guideline would be center your subject deliberately because doing so helps you accomplish your goals for a particular scene. Since details can often make or break a composition, there are two small things about this scene that I would change or address in processing. First, I would like to see a little more room between the trees and the rock in the lower right hand corner. When I am working on a composition in the field, I always spend time thinking about how elements are spaced and how spacing contributes to or detracts from the feeling of balance. In this case, the trees and the rock feel a little bit too tight, which I think creates some unwanted visual tension, especially since one of my goals for this scene is a feeling of calm. The second thing is minor and easy to fix. I do not like the little dip in the mountain at, right at the edge of the frame on the left. This is something that I'll fix in processing in Photoshop.
again, it's a little thing. It's just something that catches my eye as one of those details that can help increase the success of a photo overall. And now we will talk about a few of the technical aspects of this photograph. From a technical standpoint, this photo is really simple to capture. For this photo, I used the following equipment. A Canon 5D Mark II camera with a 24 to 105 millimeter lens, a tripod, which is necessary due to the low light at twilight, and although I am not completely certain, it is likely that I used a polarizer. I use a polarizer for four things in the field. First, removing glare. Second, enhancing glare. Third, darkening skies. And fourth, enhancing rainbows. In this case, a polarizer helps enhance the reflection on the surface of the lake. As I showed earlier with the vertical composition, this lake has some interesting rocks on the shoreline. For the vertical composition, I would not want to enhance the re reflection to the same degree because I would have wanted the rocks to show through. In the case of the photo that I ended up selecting, the strong reflection is essential to the success of the photograph, and in this case, a polarizer can help enhance the reflection even more. Here are my camera settings for this photo. My lens was set at 55 millimeters, which compared to the 35 millimeter vertical composition makes the mountains look significantly bigger and more imposing, which was one of my goals for this scene. For my exposure, I used F10 for 1 13th of a second at ISO 100. It is likely that I focused on the rocks in the foreground. At this focus point, the aperture of F10 will allow me to get the rocks the foreground reflection, and the background mountains all in focus while using one of the sharper aperture settings for my lens. When I am in the field, I always use Live View plus the Depth of Field Preview button to check both near and far focus. If your camera does not allow that set of operations, you can always take a photo and then check your focus on your LCD, making adjustments as necessary. While I often know in the field that I intend to process a photo in black and white, I made that decision for this photo years later. Like I discussed a few minutes ago, I came upon this photo in my Lightroom catalog and liked the natural contrast combined with the strong visual elements. In my ebook on black and white photography, I devote a full chapter to the process of visualizing the final result. From my perspective, once you learn to use processing tools, they are generally pretty straightforward to apply. The harder part is knowing what you want to accomplish with your processing. Thus, before I start any photo, I spend time thinking through these major questions. What story do I want to tell with this photograph? What elements of the scene do I want to emphasize or de-emphasize? And what mood do I want to convey? By answering these questions, I can then help make some processing choices that emphasize the mood, the story, and the elements that I want to play up most so that I can successfully meet my goals for a photograph. I find that without going through this kind of process before ever opening a photo in Lightroom or Photoshop, I don't have enough of a roadmap to figure out what goal I want to have for a photo. So I always want to stop, think about that roadmap, experiment, and then move on to processing. For this photo, my main goal is accentuating the natural tonal contrast that is already present in this scene. With a lot of my black and white photography, I want to convey a dark mood or play up a scene's drama. For this photo, however, I am more interested in a mood that conveys a sense of ease rather than one of tension. This means emphasizing the contrast in the scene without adding a dark mood or a lot of tonal contrast. I want this photo to be a little bit more subtle than some of my usual black and white photography work. I also want to emphasize the striations in the mountain since they are one of my favorite aspects of this scene. I like the trees as a graphic element and will plan on keeping them darker, almost like silhouettes, but with some detail. I will also want to brighten the reflection to add some tonal contrast to the scene overall. Since the rocks along the far shoreline 
serve as a sort of visual break and an area of interest, I will want to add a bit of tonal contrast and brighten them to add some emphasis. And finally, I will also need to balance the exposure by darkening the top of the sky a bit. I want to direct the viewer's attention to the mountain, and the bright sky takes away from that goal. So generally, I will convert the photo to black and white, and then I will want to add selective contrast to add tonal contrast overall, and to a few specific areas, generally playing up the feeling of a calm scene. Like I mentioned before, I don't want this to feel too dark or too dramatic, but instead I just want to enhance the contrast that already exists in this scene. Since this photo is meant to complement my course on processing black and white photos in Lightroom, I will process this photo from start to finish using Lightroom with a few finishing touches in Photoshop. In this video, I will focus on applying Lightroom's processing tools without much explanation. If you would like to know more about how these tools can be used, you might find my full Lightroom course to be helpful. In this case, I selected a darker exposure from which to start my processing. This means that I will be bringing light into the photograph through my adjustments. I have a brighter exposure that I could have used, but it would have required more adjustments. Since I am not making many dramatic changes to this photo, I am not introducing noise or banding or otherwise degrading the file. Had I chosen to make more dramatic changes to the contrast, using the brighter exposure would have probably been a better choice from a technical standpoint, but for my purposes, with the fairly minor changes that I'm going to be making, the darker exposure will still result in a technically sound file once I'm finished. The processing for this photo is going to be pretty straightforward. First, I will make a couple of global adjustments that will apply to the entire photograph, and then I will make a couple of local adjustments that will apply to smaller areas of the photo, and then I will open it in Photoshop for a final few finishing touches. So the first thing that I'm going to do for this photo is I'm going to add a technical correction for chromatic aberration, and I'm going to do that in the lens correction area. Just click Remove Chromatic Aberration. And normally I would go and check for to make sure that it, it the automatic selection was good enough, but I'll just keep moving for the purpose of timeliness. The next thing that I will do is convert the photograph to black and white. And to do that, I will click this black and white treatment option, which is the primary way to convert a photo to black and white using Lightroom. So now you can see that this still has quite a bit of natural tonal contrast. The uh, sky is fairly bright, the trees are fairly dark, and then there are a lot of mid-tone grays in the mountains and the rocks. So the goal in processing will be to bring some contrast back to this file. And like I mentioned before, my goal isn't to bring a lot of contrast, it's just really to enhance the, con the natural contrast that is already here. Uh, the first thing I will do is go down to the black and white mix panel, which I always experiment with when I am processing a black and white photo. And I've already test processed this photo and I uh, experimented with some of these sliders and didn't really like any of the results. So I'm not actually going to make changes as part of the processing, but I will show what some of the sliders do. So here I'll move the orange slider. And you can see that that uh, brightening the oranges really brightens the, pe the peaks and then darkens when you pull the orange down. And as a reminder, those peaks are actually fairly orange. So that explains why the orange slider makes such a big difference. I'll go back down. We can try the blue and see what change the blue has. So the blue is where the shadows are for this photo. A little bit in the sky and then a lot in the middle section. You can also see how much uh, this is degrading the file that you're getting banding and uh, noise. So uh, that's one of the things to really look out for when you're using the color, these color sliders for uh, black and white photo processing. So I'm gonna reset this to auto. So that was just an example of what some of these sliders can do in processing. I sometimes find them to be helpful, but also prefer some other methods generally as well. The next thing that I'm going to do is set the black and white point and in Lightroom, I either do that with the tone curve 
or with the black and white sliders. For this photo, I'm going to use the whites and blacks sliders. And one of the ways that I always check to make sure that I'm not clipping too much is these highlight indicators near the histogram. So I'm going to turn both of these on. You can see a tiny bit of clipping here in the shadows of the trees, but nothing too, too bad. Uh, I'm going to bring up the white point here using the white slider to brighten this overall photo. And you can see the whites are starting to clip over on the left side where you see the red. So that means that the whites are starting to lose detail. So I'm going to bring that down until the histogram or the whites on the right side of the histogram just hit the edge. So this means that I'm, I brightened it, but I'm not clipping anything at this point. Uh, for the shadows right now, I think this looks pretty good. So I'm going to leave the, or the blacks, I mean, I'm going to leave the blacks alone since I have a, a pretty nicely distributed histogram at this point. I might experiment with the shadows. So that removes a lot of the detail in the trees, and I really want to maintain detail. So I might actually brighten the shadows a little bit. So we'll leave the shadows right about there for now, just to experiment. And photo processing for me is always iteration. So I'll take a few steps, assess my progress, and see how I'm doing. The next thing that I will adjust is the highlights and see if the highlights make any difference. So mostly the highlights are adjusting the peaks in the sky. I don't want to keep them bright, but not, not anything super bright. I might come back and, and readjust that a little bit later. One of the things that I'm observing with this photo right now is overall it looks too bright. So one way to address the brightness overall is just to pull down the tone curve a little bit, which I'm going to do here, just to bring some darkness back into this photo. So um, I'm fairly happy with where that ended up, just to give it a little bit more depth in the darks and the midtones. So the trees have a little, are a little bit more dark, um, or a little darker. The rocks are a little darker. So again, this is step by step to get to a final result. So no single step gets us there, but building these steps together cumulatively will get us to the result that I'm looking for. So in this case, the clarity slider could be helpful. The clarity slider adjusts midtones. And in this case, you can see the difference between pulling it down. Everything gets kind of soft and muddy. This makes a huge difference since there are a lot of midtone grays in this particular photo, the clarity slider makes a big difference. So I'm going to leave that about at 50, but now I have a little bit of clipping. So I might back off the whites a little bit and the blacks. I took a step in one direction with the clarity slider and then needed to go back and back off some of my previous adjustments to compensate. The next thing I'm going to do is add a graduated filter on the sky since the top of the sky right now is still too bright. So I'm going to add a graduated filter. And one of the things that will need to be corrected later is that this corner on the left will get darker than I want it to be. So I can fix that a little bit later. I could use an adjustment brush as well in Lightroom, but I, I am not a huge fan of the adjustment brush. So I'm going to use this graduated filter. I'll show you a little bit more exaggerated effect. So this is darkening the part of the sky under the filter and then brightening. I don't want anything too severe. So I'm going to bring this down a little bit just so that it darkens the sky. I might actually bring it down a little bit more so that the sky is visibly darker with that adjustment. I'll turn that on and off so you can see that the sky overall got a little bit darker. And the goal with that adjustment is just to, I want to keep the sky around the mountains brighter, but I don't want the brightness to extend to the edge of the frame. So focusing most of the visual interest around the center of the frame is my goal with adding this adjustment. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to do is add a radial filter around the mountains. And again, you could do this with an adjustment brush, but the radial filter uh, for this adjustment is more than flexible enough. I'm not going to be making any super dramatic changes. I just want to add a little bit of mid-tone contrast around these mountains. 
So uh, if I were making a more dramatic adjustment or really wanted to fine tune my changes, uh, the adjustment brush would probably be a better choice. So I'm going to make the radial filter just a little bit bigger so that it covers all of the mountains. And then I'm going to invert it because I want the filter to apply to the inside of the filter. So with this, the exposure was automatically applied and I wasn't interested in that change. What I want to do is increase the clarity here. So this is another example of a place where I want to increase the midtone contrast. So as you can see, there are a lot of grays in the mountains. So by increasing the clarity, we increase the contrast in those mountains. And I can show you an example of pulling the clarity slider down and then pulling it back up. So getting a lot more contrast with this adjustment. And since there aren't any really there's no reason in this particular case to use a finer tool like the adjustment brush. Let's say that I only wanted to darken these mountains. This would not be the right tool to choose for that, uh, that type of adjustment because I would need it to be more precise. But in the case of wanting to adjust the clarity of the mountains and have it affect some of these trees, this is, this kind of rough tool actually works just fine in this circumstance. So now with this photo, I feel like it's in a pretty good place. Uh, I'd say it's, it, I, I'm happy with how the contrast looks and I'm happy with where I'm at with the processing. I might want to make a couple of final adjustments to the whites and the blacks since I can see that I'm clipping the whites a little bit here. So I'm going to pull back on the whites just a little bit just to get, just to make sure that there's detail in all of my brightest tones within the photo. And then I'm not clipping any of the blacks, so I'm actually going to pull back on the blacks to darken them just a little bit, bring the edge of the histogram much closer to the left side, because I, I do want some deep tones in this photograph. So right now, this photo feels pretty well finished. I'm going to open this in Photoshop to show you a few final adjustments. So now the photo is open in Photoshop. And I'm going to show you two things that you can do in Lightroom and one thing that you can only do in Photoshop. So the first thing is that you can do in both is dodging and burning. You can use the adjustment brush in Lightroom to lighten and darken specific areas of the photo, but I like the controls in Photoshop better. So even though you can get similar results, I'm going to uh, demonstrate the, the process here in Photoshop. And then you can also do cleanup. So spot healing, the spot healing tool uh, or spot removal tool in Lightroom. I'm going to use the spot healing tool in Photoshop just because it's a lot quicker to use. And then the thing that you can't do in Lightroom is add an Orton effect, which is a little bit of a, a final action that adds a little bit of contrast and a little bit of glow. Uh, so the dodging and burning, I added two layers, one for burning and one for dodging, and I explained how to do all of this in my video course on using Photoshop to process black and white photos. So in this case, the changes that I made with burning, which is darkening, uh, I added a little bit of darkness to these striations in the mountains, but aside from that, I didn't make any major changes. In terms of dodging, I did use a couple of different techniques. First, I used just a, a plain paintbrush in white to brighten some of the parts of the mountain on the far left side of the frame. And then I also uses, used a technique called luminosity painting, which lets you darken or brighten while increasing or decreasing contrast. So it's a little bit more sophisticated of an approach for dodging and burning. I used that on the rocks on the far shoreline. So I'll turn these adjustments on and off so you can see again. So on the left side, I brightened the areas that were affected by the graduated filter in Lightroom, and then also slightly brightened the mountain's reflection in uh, on the left side again. So turn that on and off. And then I also slightly uh, brightened and increased contrast in the rocks along the far shoreline.
The next thing that I did was added an Orton effect, and this is an action that I have prepared that I use on many of my photos, and it adds a little bit of glow and a little bit of contrast just as a final step. So it's a pretty subtle effect here. I think I applied it at 15%, yes. So turning that on and off, it darkens the trees a little bit and adds a little bit of contrast to the rocks. So just that final last step in processing this photo. And then I did some cleanup. So you, I'll turn this on and off and you can see where I did some cleanup. I eliminated some bright spots in the reflection and some bare spots in the trees just for visual continuity. So turn that on and off again. I never clone in or clone out major things within a photo, but in this particular case, uh, I feel like addressing those few little spots makes it a stronger image. So my goal for this photo was to enhance the natural contrasts that already exist in the scene. So enhancing the contrast in the mountains, the rocks at the far shoreline, the contrast between the, re the uh, brighter reflection and the darker foreground rocks, all while leaving a little bit of detail in the darker sections of the photograph and a little bit of detail in the lighter sections. I didn't want to get too dark or too dramatic because I did want to convey more of a sense of calm and serenity through this photo, uh, whereas a lot of my black and white work gets much more into the darker, more dramatic scene. Uh, this I really wanted to to play up more just the kind of the feeling of being calm and enjoying a beautiful mountain scene in a beautiful mountain range. So with that, we will wrap up this field to finished number six for this photo of Medicine Lake from the Canadian Rockies and Jasper National Park. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time.